Okay, I'll call this meeting of the Pawtucket School Committee to order at um, 6.34. Ms. Liss, will you please take a roll call? Ms. Vanolo. Mr. Chabano. Ms. Grant. Here. Mr. Knight. Here. Mr. Larby. Here. Mr. Marino. Here. Ms. Doobie. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of, the States of America and to the Republic of which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I'm very excited about the first item on our agenda because it has been a long, long time since we've had special reports of student representatives and I'm looking forward to hearing about what's been happening in our high school. So um, first we have representatives from Charles E. Shea, um, Zach Pinto and Glenara Santos. Are they here? Wonderful, you can just come up to the podium. Thank you for having us with you today. My name is Zachary Pinto. Um, I'm a Shea student, athlete, uh, president of my class, and secretary of our key club. This is my classmate, Gineris. Hi, I'm Gineris Santos. I am the president of the sophomore class, and I am also in key club. And today we're just going to tell you some things that have been going on at Shea recently. On August 25th, we held a ninth grade jump up day at Shea. Approximately 80 students attended. All students and even groups of parents were placed into small pods and they would travel throughout the school building learning about our Shea expectations for academics, extracurricular activities, and behavior. We, along with Tolman, held a graduation ceremony for our August graduates. We are very proud of our accomplishments and wish them well. Our sports teams have begun some of their seasons. Um, it's early to tell, but we do have some wins in, as far as sports goes in our boys football, or football, I mean, girls volleyball, um, boys and girls soccer, cross country, and uh, tennis. A big shout out goes to all our teachers for coming back and working with us this year. They received program training from the district and are well prepared to help us achieve our dream of graduating. Our student leadership activities have begun. Uh, Key Club will pick up where it left off last year. We will continue our service learning projects that benefit the whole community throughout the year. Our first family engagement meeting happens tomorrow where we update our parents on all, the, uh, on all our different programs and enable them to ask questions. This will be, for, this will be our official launch of our Shea Parents Association. Our main priority is for our student leadership team to establish a bridge between all three high schools in the city where we can effectively work with the leadership at Tolman and JMW to positively impact our city. On the first day of school, our seniors set their alarm early and join together on the front lawn of Shea at 5.45 a.m. for the senior sunrise. Our seniors have their senior picnic coming up. The class of 22 is making a senior documentary of their senior year. And for the junior class, we have class elections coming up. In closing, we would like to share to you that what Shea stands for. We are skilled, honorable, empowered achievers. Go Raiders! Thank you! Thank you so much, Zach and Glen Harris. Um, our representative from Tolman is Joni Perez here. Hi, Joni. Good, how are you? Good evening. My name is Johnny Perez, and I am student council president of the class of 2022, and I'm a senior at Tolman High School. I'm excited to touch base with you upon a few things regarding our school. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the freshman orientation barbecue that took place on Thursday, August 26th. The orientation went extremely well, as we had numerous students attend. Not only did we have a lot of student involvement, but there was an incredible amount of parent engagement. The staff and student volunteers were extremely helpful in guiding the freshmen and ensuring that they start off the school year strong. That Saturday, August 28th, Tolman hosted a car wash for our juniors and seniors. We had an amazing turnout. Everyone had a great time, and it was thrilling to see some people like Seth Magaziner, Sandra Cano, and Roberto Marino, who stopped by to give some kind words of encouragement. 
Their kind words were a great motivator that afternoon. A few days later, it was the first day of school. It was evident that all students and teachers were excited. Thankfully, there have not been any issues with masks. Everyone seems to be complying with the rules. And finally, our fall sports have been going extremely well. All athletes are excited to be back on the field and on the court. The girls varsity team, volleyball team, has won two games already. And we can't wait to see what the future has in store. The students have been incredibly supportive of their fellow classmates and friends by going to their games and cheering them on. In less than a month, Tolman has accomplished a lot as a community. And we can't wait to see what the following weeks have in store. Thank you. And representing um, JMW, we have Delana Degnan. Hi, um, my name is Delana Degnan, and I am a senior theater major at Jacqueline M. Walsh School for the Performing Arts, and I am hoping to become student council president. Um, this past weekend, JMW and Shea students actually participated in the YMCA block party, um, where we had dancers and singers perform, as well as the Shea fashion group. Uh, JMW art and theater majors participated in face painting, ceramic painting, and canvas painting, and we had a booth recruiting for the 2022 to 2023 school year. As our school year has gone underway, we have started our CCRI dual enrollment. Um, we have 54 students enrolled, including myself. Um, some are remote for our courses and others are bused to and from CCRI. Um, we also started our iReady diagnostic for math and reading last week, and we are continuing this week. And we are looking forward to seeing our results to improve our education. Um, some of the upcoming events that we are in the process of planning are um, an open house for prospective new students in November to recruit for the 2022 to 2023 school year. Um, we are also participating in local school open houses, such as the learning community in Central Falls, as well as Segway in Central Falls and the Gordon School in East Providence. Lastly, we are also sending out postcards promoting our CTE pathways to eighth grade students in Pawtucket and other communities. Thank you. It really um, makes the meeting when we start um, with the student representatives. So I, I really applaud you all for being here. You are obviously more than welcome to stay for the meeting, um, but we also understand that you all have homework and other um, engagements in the evening. Um, Next up on the agenda, we have a presentation, Dr. McWilliams. Yes, good evening, everyone. It brings me pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda Gifford, who oversees, she's a director of our early childhood program, and she is going to share with us um, a presentation to give us an overview of early childhood. Good evening, Chairperson Duby, Deputy Chairperson Moreno, School Committee members, and Dr. McWilliams. Welcome to Pawtucket's Early Childhood Education Program. We currently have classrooms in three different buildings. At Nathaniel Green, we have two four-year-old Rhode Island pre-K classrooms, which are the state classrooms. At Fallon, we have six integrated classrooms with 15 students in each classroom. We have two Rhode Island pre-K classrooms, and those classrooms have 20 students and they are all four-year-old students. In addition, we have class five classrooms at Curtis Elementary School for the three-year-old students. Those are two and a half hour sessions and there's an AM and a PM session for those students. For instruction, we currently use the creative curriculum, which is approved by the Rhode Island Department of Education. This was ordered for all classrooms, new, the newest editions last year. Each unit is based on theme deck, themes with activities and assessment recommendations. This curriculum goes along with our assessments, which is teaching strategies gold. There are 30 objectives. Many of those objectives also include dimensions that guide teachers thinking about various aspects of that objective and help clarify what it addresses. Parents receive information three times during the year with the student's progress. This is just an example of all the dimensions and objectives that are assessed throughout the year. As you can see under, if you look under language, there's the, the objective and then there are a few extra dimensions underneath them. And this is trimesters that all, all students are assessed on all of these skills. And this is how they, the, um, the, how that guides them to assess those students 
and indicate where they are on that level. This goes from birth to third grade, and that's the color scheme. Right, now, the four-year-olds would be in blue, and the, the three-year-olds would be in green, if they are on level. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yep, Mr. Charbonneau. Dr. Good, good evening. Thank you for that. Two and a half hours for what is it? What was it? That's the three-year-old program. So this is their first time entering school, and it is a two. And it, it's always been a two and a half hour a day program. It's actually what most districts use for like their three and four-year-old programs, and we just use it in three. They're little. They're just coming in. They're adjusting. So they don't have rest time. They just have all assessment and their outdoor time during those two and a half hours. It just I. From a logistical standpoint, it seems like it's, I mean, by the time the kids get in, get settled, get their coats off, and it, it just, so I, I don't know if there's an opportunity to look at expanding that or, it, or if it's something that we would even consider, but it just seems like that, that day must be really rushed for everybody involved. It is, and actually Dr. McWilliams and I have had discussions over this because the struggle is that for a student to be in the three-year-old program, if they do not have an IEP, they would, the parents have to transport. So the families have to be available to, to do that transportation and someone has to be available for that half day. We've had these, dis we, we actually just started talking about this last year because since I took over last year, we have been making changes and moving forward with, with all the right initiatives that they're looking for. So it's just logistics that we would have to, to figure out because okay. we need number the number of spots we have. So that would mean additional classrooms if they were longer days. Got it. Okay. Questions? Ms. Grant. Um, um, thank you, Dr. Gifford, for your presentation. How um, does it, um, the um, preschool programs, um, kind of cross with special education. How do are the special ed children um, in their own classes? Do you have mentors? Um, is there a person who works directly with you in regards to preschool, in regards to special education? So I'm actually certified in special education administration. So I, I work all along that. I work with RIDE with their special education department and their regular education department. The classrooms are split so that um, we would have seven students that needed some support services and eight students that did not. Um, again, it's a struggle to get that balance in the three-year-old classrooms, but we do always have, have those peers that are in those classrooms. The state classrooms are very different. That is completely lottery. They do not identify if a student has a disability or not. It's the itinerant model that they use. So the, the teachers are in the classroom and a special educator pushes in, supports those teachers, supports those students, and they are required to have collaborative meetings that includes the teacher, the special educator, and the parent where they're updating parents um, throughout the month. So, um... Is there someone from the special ed department that um, you work directly with for preschool? Because as they grow, how, how does the communication work between you being in the schools and um, them getting this information passed from you to them? So I always, I, Courtney Silver is my education coordinator. She does works on the state rooms and then she also um, is does preschool in the special ed department, but I have always worked alongside the special education department. So prior to the end of the year, my teachers put, put in projections um, for their students. We worked with the special education department. We set up um, meetings with the schools, the, the schools that will be receiving them. So all of that communication does take place prior to the end of the year. Me, in addition to the um, special education coordinator or assistant um, director work together with that. Okay. Because I'm not always, so I'm not always in the schools. I try my best to be in the buildings, but I do have to be in central administration for different meetings. And then the other question I have is, um, in regards to um, the children in the special um, who have needs or requ require therapies, how, um, I, I would assume we're what, second, third week, I would assume there'd be no compensatory services yet, 
But how do we, um, you know, we have children who are nonverbal and um, how do we communicate on a daily basis with the parents in regards to, um, you know, if they, they've, they're receiving the services or, or what they're receiving throughout the day? So the teachers have, we have an orientation at the beginning of the year where the teachers speak with the parents um, about how, how it is set up. And then the parents keep, have always kept those open um, lines of communication between parents and teachers. We are using a new communication system this year that they're just getting together um, because they also have to learn how to use it. But they will send messages to them um, about what's going on during the day. They, they t do pictures um, and send pictures of the children to the parents. And all of our services in preschool are, are take place in the classroom, so there's not pull-out services. So the, they, the, the um, service providers are also teaching the teachers you know, additionally, that so PTOT and speech, the children aren't getting those services individually. The they can have them individually. It might be in a group. That the Rhode Island Department of Education early childhood model is that itinerant model, where they feel that research shows that the children will utilize those skills and can transfer those skills better if they're taught in the classroom. PT might end up needing some some of those things out of the classroom, but they also have to go outside every day. So the three-year-olds have to be outside for 20 minutes. The four-year-olds have to be outside for an hour um, every day. For, and that's how where the Bright Stars, our rating comes from. And that's um, part of the ECRA's rating that we have. So sometimes the PT services will be done while they're outdoors. OK. And then how do you keep track of um, compensatory services if they someone calls in sick or someone um, there's not a position filled? So the teachers do that. They reach out to Courtney if it's silver, if there's any concerns on that. So there's no spreadsheet or your preschool just doesn't have a spreadsheet of that? They add, the, we, that spreadsheet is available and they add those in. The therapists also add those in if they haven't been there. Okay, so if we requested a copy of that or I requested a copy of compensatory services, I, you would not be responsible for that, correct? I do not have that. That comes through the special ed department. It comes through the special ed department. <laughs> Okay, thank I have you. lots of other things I have to do. I'm sorry? I have lots of other responsibilities of my reports to ride, so that, that piece does Well, it just that. sounds like special that children who are three, now that um, they're not, you know, children who are three enter school mm -hmm. and schools are responsible for the therapies at that time. So um, if they're entering preschool and you're in charge of preschool, I would think you'd have access to that also. Um, because you want to make sure that um, these children are receiving the services that they deserve and that are in their IEP. So I'm very surprised that you don't have access to that and that it's not a shared drive. So, and, but and thank you. We, I appreciate it. We do have a new director of pupils personal services and we've been working together on those things to change them. So okay. obviously always move forward. Thank you. Um, I just want to wrap up with um, one question, um, just a clarification. You said that there were five classrooms, a.m., p.m. in the three-year-old program. Is that 10 groups of students? Yes. Okay, so there's, yep. ten, there's 10 classes of students yep. split up into five classrooms. Yep. Okay, yep. thank there's you. five teachers and then an a.m. and p.m. Thank you so much, Dr. Gifford. Thank you. Okay, um, next on our agenda is public participation. Um, we have one person signed up. Yep, and uh, I believe she, uh, Hirsch is indicating to me that she is online. She's gonna be um, sharing her comments that way. Um, so when she's ready, Hirsch, just give me a signal and I'll introduce her name.
The name is Shana DeBrito. Or DeBrito. Um, is it? Can anyone use the raise hand function? Is that a possibility for participants? They can. They okay. Can. Okay. So if if um, if Shana DeBrito is on, if um, you can raise your hand from the um, participants. And Hirsch, how do you do that if you're on a phone? Star six. Okay. Shana DeBrito, D E B R I T O. Huh? No, that's not the name. Okay, well, um, I, I, she did share what she was speaking about. It's not an item on our agenda. So, um, Hirsch, if you uh, are able to um, see her at a later point and um, I let her know that she can participate, you can just alert us, okay? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, and no one has signed up in person? Ms. Liss? Okay, thank you. Um, we will move on to new business action discussion items. Um, homeschool student program 2021 to 2022. Dr. McWilliams? Yes. So I'm bringing before you the homeschool program um, that I believe you had it in your packets and uh, the list uh, by initial in school of the students that have signed up to date. Um, according to Rhode Island state law and our own policy, um, we do bring those to the school committee. And I wanted to briefly go over you know, what this means and, and, and how it happens. In this particular year, there you'll see in the numbers, there is an increase in our homeschool uh, students. And RIDE has also um, put on their website an actual site now dedicated um, to answering the questions of homeschool parents. So um, it is, you know, probably likely to have increased due to uh, COVID. There, I know I've spoken to many families and you know for whatever reason due to their particular circumstance they're um, not comfortable at this time so i do hope uh, that as we go forward that we won't have as many numbers it is less than two percent of our population uh, but it still has increased over the past few years that we've been dealing with the pandemic so the way it works is um, a family will submit a letter of intent and that will come via email or mail and um, that is uh, lists the uh, parents, the student name, their grade, their date of birth, and their uh, home school. And then it's followed up um, with a call or an email by my office to inquire um, as to their program and the agreement that we asked them to sign for homeschool instruction, which was also in your packet. And um, this is all timed and dated and put on an Excel sheet. And then um, the, it, it, it needs to come before the school committee, which is why we're here this evening. And then um, we will follow up with them, let them know that they are uh, approved and all set. Um, I will have to say though, according to state law, and I believe you also have that in your packets, um, if, if there's any non-approval of a homeschool program that goes to the Rhode Island Department of Education, and they can appeal there. Um, and then at the end of the year, the parents, uh, the families submit to us their attendance and their grading or their assessments for that year. And oftentimes, at the same time, they're giving their letter intent for those who have been consistently doing it for the next school year. Once that is done, the uh, individual schools are notified that the student is moving into a home school and it's indicated in the computer um, as an H, which means that they are homeschooled. Motion approved. Second. Send a motion to approve the homeschool student program 2021 to 2022. By Mr. Charbonneau, it's been seconded by Mr. Marino. Is there any discussion? Mr. Knight. Why do we have two uh, St. Raphael students in this. 
St. Regis? Mm -hmm. Oh, they're, well, their home school. But that wouldn't be part of ours. No, that's, and there's also a Kansas, that looks like a typo. Okay, I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. That is not correct. Uh, uh, just, I will we'll resolve this tonight. Yeah, and just, I will. Um, so is, is the answer that it's a typo? Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Grant? Um, I actually have two questions. Um, so if a family decides in the middle of the year um, that they want to take their child out of school and then homeschool them from there on. Um, it, is that possible or? Yes, so okay. we would be coming back with that list. This is the list as of uh, currently, but you know we would be coming back to a school committee meeting with additional lists for those. It is, okay. yes. Um, and then, um, I know that the, the student is still basically part of the district. So in regards to um, a Chromebook or things like that, if if the students or the families need um, supplies, um, do we still supply that for them or are they responsible for getting their own, um, you know, Chromebooks or Things right. Like so, um, and uh, our attorney is here, and I will ask him to weigh on this. We do have a textbook loan program, so it is a part of um, the law that we uh, provide them with textbooks. But as a good point that you just raised is that much of what we're doing now is digital and online, and so um, we have, you know, an assessment that they can participate in in any. A uh, special education student or assessment that would also be something that we provided. We have not um, addressed the Chromebook situation. I, th that would be a question I would like to ask legal to weigh in on. So the regulations require that we do provide the textbooks, but other instructional material is at the expense of the family doing the homeschooling. So uh, the Chromebooks would fill into that category. Now there are districts who do provide some additional instructional materials <laughs> beyond the textbooks, but you're not required to under the regulations. Thank you. Ms. Manala? So I know it's um, optional that they have any testing through us. But is there anything that verifies that the students have learned what they need to learn? We do not have and we are not required to verify that. And the only way we would know is if they return back to our school and they would be a part of our school. But the assessment, um, an individual family can um, have their own assessment program. And I do have to say that some of the families that I've spoken to are actually using an online um, program. So they are doing that, but not all families, you know, are required to do that. However, we have an assessment tool that we can offer to them. So why they're not does required. not require no. proof that they've educated their child? Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so the, uh, the regulations do uh, require that we do make the assessments available, mm -hmm. but they do not mandate. And so we are not required to do it. And essentially, at the conclusion of the year, we accept um, the homeschooling parents' uh, statement that the program has been completed successfully. And they have to do that. They um, have to report back in at the end of the year, but that's all the regulations require. Thank you. That's a shame. It's been a motion to improve. It's been seconded. I don't see any further discussion. Ms. Lisley, please take a roll call. Ms. Vanola. Yes. Mr. Chabonneau. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larvey. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Um, Mr. Cristino, I'm assuming by the very precariously placed computer that 
Oh, okay. And then I'll, I'll just wait for that computer to fall over. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, okay, so we'll move on to the next item, which is approval of play yard upgrade Cunningham Elementary School. How's everybody doing tonight? Hello, Mr. Silver. Um, I'm before you tonight seeking approval of the upgrade of the Cunningham school play yard it's the lodge play yard that wraps around from the play uh, from the playground to the kindergarten side along uh, slater uh it's a total of 24,120 square feet it's we identified it as needing to be done over due to lodge cracks and multiple dips in it uh we asked oak hill for for an mpa quote and received the following response Saw cut and remove 2,475 square feet of existing asphalt, which will correct the dips in it. Furnish install three inch top course of asphalt in those for those 24,075 uh, square foot. Crack seal 6,890 square feet and seal coat the entire 24,120 square feet for a total cost of $22,837. Um, this would be taken out of capital, and we recommend that the school committee accepts Oak Hill proposal. Okay. Second. Is that a motion to uh, approve um, Oak Hill's proposal? And Mr. Larrab, it's been seconded by Mr. Marino. Um, discussion, Mr. Knight. Uh, my question is, have we approved going out the bid on any of this? Or is this just somebody decided they're going to go out to bid? I do not believe that there's been an approval to go out to bed. I believe that um, it's an MPA quote. It was off the MPA. It doesn't matter that it's an MPA. And my point that I'm trying to make is we're supposed to approve any repairs that are done and then go out to bid, not the other way around. Okay. Um, I. I'll make a note of that, Mr. Knight. I, at least being on this committee for six years, I know that this seems to be about how we've been conducting business for the past six years, but. Um, it's only since they started the house doctor where we haven't gone to bid. They have to have approval to go out to bid or to go to an MBA. And I believe I'll ask Mr. Conley if he agrees with that or disagrees. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not aware of a pre-approval uh, by the committee to seek the bids. You're absolutely free to reject it when it comes before you. Um, I, I can look at your own policies uh, to see, uh, but normally it's, it's not required before you go out to bid, but you absolutely do have the ability to reject the bid and reject doing the specific so with the, the specific task or subject of the bid as well. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Uh, Mr. Chauvin, and then back to Mr. Knight, yes. Is there a, uh, Attorney Conley, is there a threshold that the state sets on a, a dollar ceiling that we can go ahead and approve these bids without, these, these awards without necessarily going out to bid? I, I somehow want to say a hundred and forty nine thousand dollar number sticks to my head. No, it's, it's actually much lower. Um, it's significantly lower. It's seventy five hundred dollars. So anything above seventy five hundred, we have to go out to bid for. Yeah, it's above seventy five hundred. You need to get. Although you don't need to go through the bidding process, you need to make at least three contacts. Um, either through emails, phones, or, and you need to document those three contacts. Um, and I suppose that's kind of a bidding process, but it's not the formal bidding process. Okay, so I, I guess I, I wonder, did we make, did we contact three of the firms? From what I understood, as long as we use the MPA, we did not have to go out for quotes on it, multiple quotes. 
Mr. Conley, can you clarify, please? Yes, I can. I saw somebody do that, I promise. Uh, the, uh, the, we, we can go to the MPA and we can use somebody off of the MPA, but we still need to have three touches in order to below the threshold. I don't know. Can you what clarify is, what a touch is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I meant by a touch is you need uh, the MPA is one, uh, the a, a contact to a local vendor is an, uh, an email to local vendor uh, for the with the same exact specs, but you don't need to go out and advertise a bid. You don't need to go out to a formal RFP if it's below that threshold. But the MPA does constitute a sufficient contact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Knight. I believe. Um, this is $22,837. I think the problem is uh, we're going willy-nilly on these bids. We don't know who's been contacted, who hasn't. Oak Hill Farm is, I think, in Coventry. What about uh, the Tucket companies? Are they in the uh, MPA? We don't know who, who's doing the contacting or how they're doing it. So there should be some process where we know they're going to go out to do this. There used to be, and in fact, we did say we want to replace the fence. And we said yes or no. It wasn't just they decided to do it. This is money that our taxpayers are spending. So we should take control of that. Agreed that if we need something, we agree to do it with the MPA if we have to but we need to know about it before we do it. Other than that, they can commit us to $100,000 worth of projects without our approval. As far as I know, they're asking our approval right now before they approve that. I'm sorry? I, I believe they're asking our approval right now before they approve it, before they do they've anything. They've already swept the number and they've already entered into a recommendation. Okay. You know, there's like five different places here. This is something that we should know about, that they're going out to look for this stuff beforehand. It isn't just they decide to go look at it. And I appreciate your position, Chris, because you were told that you could do that. Well, you can't. We're supposed to know what you're going out to look at. It's the same thing that we're doing with the schools right now. If something has to be fixed, we have to know about it. It's not just, well, we got to go do this and we're spending the money. We need to know about it, approve it, and get find out where the, who they contacted. A few years back, we contacted a vendor, uh, Kelly Floor, that no longer has employees. We couldn't use them. But they're on the MPA, because they used to have employees. So, you know, I think we need to get this straightened out. Ms. Grant? Um, yeah, I just have a question. It sounds like um, this um, playground is in very bad shape. Uh, yeah. Is it is it blocked off so our students aren't using That's this? That's the play yard they play in every day. Because it seems like, you know, we could have a situation if someone fell, got hurt, um, because we are aware of the situation and, and how bad it is. Um, is there any way, I know we're discussing, you know, getting a new one, but for safety reasons, is there any way we can kind of direct the school to not allow the children to play on it at this time? Um, I would have to defer to the superintendent on that. If, if it's not going to be replaced, then we would, um, we would need to do that. Right, but, but tomorrow, if a, a student goes there and um if even if we do approve it to be replaced it they're not going to start tomorrow or monday so the safety issue is still there that's why we're replacing it <laughs> um so don't you think we should you know maybe block it off and not let the students use it while uh 
so no one gets hurt. I would think safety would be uh, one of our top priorities more than anything, you know. Dr. Williams? So um, they have been using it, and um, I feel confident that the teachers and the principal would ensure that they keep the students safe. If um, I will definitely follow up right after this meeting to ensure that if it's going to be a situation um, where there's grave concern from the school committee, then I will have them shut it down. Uh, Ms. Bonolo, Ms. Moreno, and Mr. Knight. Um, the next three bids are all of significant amounts, and I agree with Joe. Um, oh, there's only two more bids after well, this. The other two plus this is three. But um, I think we've always gone for three. We've always asked for three quotes. And I would like to see us ask for three quotes. So I would like to make a motion to table this. There's a motion to table by Ms. Bonolo. It's been seconded by Mr. Knight. Um, Ms. Wilson, you please take a roll call. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Mr. Shabno. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larvey. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Juby. Yes. Okay. Motion has been made to table um, B, C, and D. Um, so we are now on E, approval of RIDO Survey Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Yes. So every other year, RIDE um, and RIDO have a behavioral health, uh, mental health survey that they um, administer randomly across the state. Uh, the last couple of years, it wasn't done due to the COVID. Um, so they have randomly selected three of our schools that uh, they are looking for us to approve. It is optional as a school department. We do not have to um, um, support this. However, you know, I do think that it gives important data for um, our state, the behavioral mental health uh, department and the uh, Department of Health moving forward to know how to um, allocate resources and services for our youth. And so um, a parent does have the option to not participate. And when, it, when they identify three schools, it is not necessarily, it's not all the students in that school. They're actually only looking for 2,000 students across the state. So it might be a random a selection of students in those identified schools. So it maybe it might be one class um, in one school, one class in another. Uh, they're just looking to get a random sampling of those grades six through 12 and, and gather that data for research. And the best way to gather the data on mental health is really from the students themselves. It is anonymous, the, there's no identifying. So once it's randomly selected, the permission slip would go home that we get from RIDE. This is done online, by the way, would go home and a parent can opt um, their child out of it. And when they actually take it on the computer, there's no, um, there's no connection, ident identification of that student. It's just a, a random sampling. So we're looking for your approval so that we can um, participate in that. And it will be some time, uh, this school year, uh, I think they're looking for a response back. Then a motion to approve the approval of the RIDO survey. And Ms. Manolo has been seconded by Mr. Knight. Discussion, Ms. Manolo. Um, question, I know the parents have an option of opting out. However, there's no verification that the parent has even seen that this is being done. How are we reaching out to them to confirm that a parent has actually seen what they're up out on. So um, we would have to, so let's just say they randomly uh, select one particular class in the sixth grade at a particular school. In order for that survey to take place, we would need that signed um, permission slip back. 
Okay, so we would have to, we the, would receive the sign from the yes. was saying yes. Yes. And, but they, how do they opt out with right? So it's just the permission slip, so it's actually So it, it would be, it would be done in the school. So if, if there's gonna be a 35, it takes about 30 to 35 minutes to answer the 50 questions. So this, so in other words, they wouldn't be answering the questions without, um, if they did not have, I see what you're saying. So if we had, a, what I'm saying, it's is, a passive consent. What what we have, and, right. and and we will not have. Yes, you're correct in that way. It's a passive consent. Right. So if the parents don't see it, they don't know that that's their right. Children are being. If the student doesn't bring it home, questions. Correct. So that that is one flaw in the system, and um, I can call and contact Ride and see if in Rido and see if they would do a a different type of consent, but this is what they have uh, submitted. Um, the other question, just one sec, is um, do we get a report on their findings, not with individual, but um, in general of what they find in our schools because we have a different populace than a lot of other schools? So the well, sampling is, the yeah, sampling is the, the few thousand that they're looking um, at across the state. So we, we wouldn't be identifiable to any particular town or school or anything like that. Okay, thank you. And um, I know on wellness, we get this report when it comes out and yes, it's just, this is Rhode Island. It's a sampling of what we see in Rhode Island. Okay. Superintendent, <clears throat> a couple of questions. One is 30 to 35 minutes during the school day of instruction time to complete this? So, correct, so it would be during the day, which is instruction time, and even if it was in the high school, if it was an advisory time, it, they don't have 35 minute advisories. So it would be a random sampling during the day. It would, it would definitely be during, it would be taken away from instruction time. And those students who opt out for those 30 to 35 minutes do? There would have to be an accommodation made for them if they're not gonna be part of the. And the last thing is you mentioned that it's, do they use the school email? In other words, if this survey is sent to my son or my daughter, it's easily identifiable when they send it back because their name's part of, part of the email. No, right? no, there's no, there's no, so what I've been told and what I've read is that there is no identification. So um, I can follow up to confirm that. But the email will come back if, if I were to take it and send it to you, you would recognize my email address, no? In other words, if it were Jay Chabonel at psdri.net. No, I don't believe that they use, I think they have a different like a coding. Survey monkey it's a, or it's a coding like... of a, um, a confidential anonymous survey. So it, yeah. when it it's, goes... Oh, it's, you're thinking it's our Google type of survey? That, that... Well, I'm wondering how they're gonna get the survey to our kid's email address. Dr. Williams, only because this was presented to us in wellness. Mm -hmm. um, it's as far as I was uh, like understood, it's a portal. They don't log in at, with any identification. It's just a portal where they're taking the survey. So it's okay, not so it's it, not sent to them as take oh, this survey sent over your email. Perfect. It's they're logged in during the day. But like I said, that was how it was explained to us at wellness. I just don't want our students using our, their psdri.net email addresses because I think that will easily identify them in the survey they would have set, set back. If it's I a portal, I'm, I'm good. I agree, Dr. Williams. And can you please clarify if I'm mm -hmm. correct on that, uh -huh. that they don't have to have a login of any sort, which as, the, as so, Mr. Charbonneau says, would mean- I know in other surveys, not this particular one, this is my first experience with this one, but in other surveys, it, it would be a link that you have to link on to get to that portal. Mm -hmm. So that's how there's no identify, but I will okay. confirm that. Who said it was explained to us? Who was it explained to? What, this, this, the results of this survey are presented to wellness. Um, but who was the, who requested the survey from whom? Where did it come from? This survey? Yeah. Dr. This, McWilliams. Yes, yeah, so this came, this goes out to um, school departments from the Rhode Island. It's signed actually by the Rhode Island Department of Health, the Rhode Island Department of Mental Health and the commissioner. They send out, they um, randomly select schools. So it's a, a random, I don't, you know, their process is random. And then once they have their random process, they send out to those superintendents in those districts 
that you've been randomly selected uh, to participate in the survey? That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking who, who contacted Ms. Doobie and explained that's how it's explained to me. No, they didn't contact me, Mr. Knight. What, so on wellness, they present the, they, they showed the findings and they explained how the survey, this was years ago when oh, it was geez. last done. They explained the findings and they said, this is a survey that we conduct. I think at that time, our school hadn't been pulled for it. Our Pawtucket schools hadn't been pulled. So it was just the Rhode Island. Okay. Mr. Moreno. Um, um, thank you. Um, I said, I um, think that the um, survey overall is healthy and it um, and helps us um, learn um, 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 what our students have in terms of uh, and I'll help them. I'm just curious if we could do a, a um, supplemental um, age um 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 from us in that um the the um the fact that the questions are um, sensitive is only brought up once in the faq and i'm afraid i've had a few of these questions in in, in particular the um suicide real Aided ones um could be um could be um could be um triggers at first glance mm -hmm. to a student who was blindly um um taking this. So uh, just sure. So if, what you're asking is, we could we do a, a a supplemental or highlight because it will be these it, questions are right sensitive. Okay. And that would go out with the permission form? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussion? Ms. Manolo? Okay, so um, you were going to check to ensure that it was on a portal? I'm going to check and ensure that it's on a, a link to a portal so it's on, so not identifiable. We can approve it this way, or should I? Change my motion to say um, pending identification of what's the word portal use because if it's something that's identifiable to the student, we don't want to use it. So, Additional. add that to the end of my motion, please. Spinola has made their motion. Mr. Moreno has seconded it. I just have one, one. Mr. Moreno. I, I, I made, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it only in English or are there other options? Because, um, the, yes, what they provide to me is in English. One of the things that I brought up to the Department of Health in a survey that they uh, rec that I recently took um, that they sent out to all superintendents is um, that it's imperative that everything that we receive is in the three languages, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And um, I do not know that they're working on that. You, you do not know or you do know? No, they're working, oh, okay. they're working on that. Okay. Is there a motion to approve um, pending the verification that there's no um, use of email addresses, there's no identifying um, email addresses. It's been seconded. Um, Ms. Lissy, please call the roll. Ms. Manolo. Yes. Mr. Chauvinow. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Juby. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Um, the next is the approval to accept receipt of the Arthur Davy Trust. Um, I believe uh, I'll start. You'll start, Dr. Please. Please. Yep. So, uh, this was um, a previous educator, I believe at Shea, um, to Potmanshire, uh, and he 
um, when he passed away, left a trust identified to um, Shay, and that now has come to um, us at the school department, and I know our attorney has been working with that trust, and so if you could come up and speak on behalf of what um, we need to do to accept this gift. So no, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the statute requires, when we receive a request like this, uh, the statute requires that the school committee approve acceptance of the request. It needs to be put in a specially identifiable account. Um, in this case, it's for Shea High School. And you can see it's for the specific purpose of establishing the Arthur L. Davies Scholarship for Science to be administered by the Science Department. Um, and it um, sets broad standards for the um, awarding of uh, the scholarship. But it doesn't set any other standards beyond what you see in the attachment that was provided to you. So it would be permissible for uh, the uh, decisions to be made in terms of uh, the amounts awarded each year um, and um, other qualifications that are not inconsistent with those um, in the bequest. The, um, uh, we're advised, although that some of the uh, estate is still be administered, uh, we are advised that we should expect to receive a little over $100,000. I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that I can. Once we accepted the trust, who would be or how would we um, determine who would be responsible um, to allocate that money and what it should, like I see that it does say that it's for science. Um, how, how is it, or how do we determine <coughs> what is a, a viable use for it? Yep. For, um, there, there are a couple of specific criteria, and then you're right, then it's more broad. But specifically, um, it has to go to Shea High School. Specifically, it has to be administered by the science department. Um, it does uh, need, uh, in its administration, to identify um, student need student ability, and such other factors as may be established by the department. So it does give discretion to set additional qualifications that are not inconsistent with the scientific requirement. There must be some kind of need-based criteria in it, um, and there must be some kind of evaluation of ability. Attorney Connick, can I interrupt? Because I think, I think you might be asking different questions. Ms. Grant, do you understand that the money is all going towards a scholarship? Oh, it's going to a scholarship. I thought it was going to. Um, so it's, it's yeah, I, that, I, that, I that middle I of the line says. I, re I really apologize. I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, you're right. I yeah, didn't so understand I heard the, the question. question. I heard you answering, and I think that Ms. Grant yeah. was saying. So the third line here says that the purpose is to establish the Arthur L. Davy Scholarship for Science. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was reading it, mm -hmm. but I missed that part. So I didn't realize. I, I so thought to clarify, was, all of the, the trust is going to award a scholarship. Award us a scholarship to give away to our students. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. I, okay. okay. Is it a one time $100,000? No, it's not. Um, it doesn't require that at all. Those additional criteria um, are left open okay. uh, to determine whether it's one student a year, five students a year, if it's $5,000, $2,500, whatever it might be, the um, language in the request is broad enough for those determination, for that determination to be made, um, and but administered by the science department at Shea High School. Okay. Um, thank you. No problem. Because I did. I, I thought it was for the action. I, I, I really apologize. I should have understood your question. That was my fault also. Mr. Knight? Oh, we, oh, do we want to do an approval before we start entering the discussion? Second. There's a motion to approve by Mr. Sharp, and it's by second by Mr. Larby. Mr. Knight. This is still under discussion. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So your question. So there's no vote. Okay. Yes. yes. Please. Uh, who are we putting in charge of this at Shea High School? 
and how do we determine if in fact it's the chairperson of the science committee if it's the same one year to the next right does that have to be um memorialized in the agreement dr williams i know we give out many scholarships what what would be the procedure for it so the procedure is that there's usually a scholarship committee so the scholarship committee um would undertake this un and with the science department administering it so that some of the decisions that would need to be made by the, the scholarship committee is this going to be a hundred thousand dollars are they going to give out ten thousand per year for the next ten years um and determine you know it's going to be a committee that's going to have to make those decisions well i think we should have a discussion of this uh separate from this because this is money that we're going to be responsible for in the long run so mr knight i believe the next item is to actually discuss the creation of the scholarship this is the item that we approve whether we're going to receive the money putting the cart before the horse okay you know uh Approving the scholarship is one thing. Um, it just doesn't have any enough information to do it. So this is to approve the receipt, as in, do we want to receive the, the, the hundred thousand dollar trust? That's right. Under the statute, there has to be a specific vote from the committee to accept it, mm -hmm. as distinct from of uh, the creation and operation of the trust. Mm -hmm. We need a distinct vote to accept the funds. Okay. So that, that's our discussion now about whether we want to approve to accept the receipt of the Arthur Davies Trust. Mr. Knight. Okay, we can approve it. That's no problem. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us a process to award scholarships from this money. And we should have that set up first. So I would ask that we approve the receipt and the release, but we don't do anything else this time until we know how we're going to have the school administer it. Well, let's take so let's take let's take one item at a time. So the first one, um, we have a motion on the floor to approve the receipt of the Arthur Davy <coughs> Trust. It's been seconded. Is there any further discussion on this item? I just have a question on the. Um, boilerplate language in this which is seems to be um quite dated no all men that those present um is this language that we as policy need to amend is this language that is just part of rhode island's code that we say all men we do not need to say all men i will confess that it's been it, it is boilerplate that okay you 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 look at and and frankly you don't even almost don't read it you just process it yeah it does not need to say no okay. all men i did read it yes okay um, yep. okay um, yep. thank you for that okay um so there's been a motion it's been seconded um miss list please call the roll miss benolo yeah mr shopman yes miss grant yes mr knight yes mr larby yes mr marina yes miss doobie yes um, the motion to approve the receipt carries unanimously. Um, the next item is approval of the creation of the Arthur Davies Scholarship. Is this still, Mr. Connolly, Dr. Williams? So um, we do it this together. I know he has been working uh, with the trust on this. As he said, it's very general and very broad. It has to be administered by the science department. So it would, I would certainly take the recommendations of the committee if you have a specific um, way in which you would like to see this um, presented and created, but it would be the recommendation that it would go to the high school on the, under the direction of the um, principal to create a scholarship committee specific to this scholarship. That's how we run the other scholarships. Motion approved. Most approve on the creation of the Arthur Davies Scholarship by Ms. Marino. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant. Um, discussion. Mr. Chabonel. Um, I, I think this is, I mean, it's, it's remarkable and, and please extend our, our thanks and gratitude to the, to the trust. <clears throat> I read that it, it to be very specific to the science department at Shea. Mm -hmm. And I think we have an obligation to make sure that they play a very active role in how this money gets dispersed. So I would not be supportive of it going 
to Shea High School and then letting Shea High School decide amongst a scholarship committee that may or may not have anybody from the science department on it, how the money, what the criteria is going to be. Um, I, I would, I would ask that the science department, the science chair at Shea High School, weigh in heavily um, as to what the criteria should be and and and. Um, and as far as what the, the, I mean, it's a substantial amount of money. Uh, you know. So how do we keep this legacy and also, you know, award the scholarship year after year? So I would like them to weigh in as what they think is a, a reasonable financial amount per year as well. But that's, that's me. And if I may, Madam Chair, uh, and I apologize for interrupting, but um, that's exactly right. This scholarship committee must be the, from the science department because that is the express language of the bequest so it, it can't it can't be a scholarship committee composed of you know different faculty members from different uh departments this has to be administered by the science department it's certainly through the principal set up a scholarship committee but this one has very specific directive language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What's your name? I'm reading this and it says a student who has demonstrated the need. That means only one. It also says annually though. Where does it say so, that? On the second to last line, on an annual basis to assist a student. So annually well, a student. Who determines how much we're gonna award every year? I think that as uh, Mr. Conley has said that that is the administered by the science department would say that they are, as Mr. Charbonneau said, they are the committee that is going to meet, determine how this will look as I believe we have other scholarships mm -hmm. that work the same way and they will best determine how to distribute this money that has been so <laughs> graciously given to our schools and so clearly spelled out that it is to be given to distributed to the science department of Shea High School to be administered by the science department for the benefit of a student who has demonstrated on an annual basis. So I think it's assisting one student a year is what you're saying. Yeah. On an annual basis to assist a student it's not in pursuing five to ten, it's one student a year. I think Mr. Conley was explaining over several years, but perhaps I was No, but you're yeah. right. If you to give away by way of example, if you give away $100,000, it's going to be a single student. If One you, annual student. Right. If you carve it into $5,000 or $2,500 increments, it'll be a lot over time. It'll be many more students. Yeah. yeah so that, that's all I mean. Ms. Vanilla? Okay. So I know our Pawtucket teachers, they invest their money in order to have their scholarships. Now, the Shea Science Department will invest that money or put it in CDs or um, while they wait for the next student? So I know our CFO has been meeting with you on that. So, yeah, so the, the statute also requires that the money be, even though the trust language doesn't require it, the statute requires that the funds be placed in, for a request in an interest bearing account. So that part of the administration of it will require that. Ms. Manila. Question, will a reconciliation of it come back to the superintendent or will it all stay at Shea and become invisible to you? So with, with all financials, the CFO, right, everything to do with the school keeps track of all that. So we would be well aware of what happens and how it happens and when it happens. Okay, thank you. So the motion's been uh, seconded. Uh, please uh, hold the roll on this with us. Ms. Vanilla. With deep gratitude, yes. Mr. Chabonneau. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Nye. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. 
And um, Ms. Bonolo, thank you for um, expressing that deep gratitude for Mr. Charbonneau bringing it up. I feel like we jumped right into the discussion and analyzing it without acknowledging just how amazing it is that um, in the bequest that we were thought of in this way and that this is going to make a difference in our students' lives for years. Um, it's really wonderful. I hope many people do it. Um, uh, okay, we're moving on to um, uh, just to check in, Hirsch. Are we? Uh, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, for a discussion item, uh, and I will I will ask Ms. Liss after this meeting to communicate with Ms. Zavrito. Um, she can um, definitely be invited to our next meeting. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, before we move on, uh, yes. I would ask that uh, that you or the superintendent or both send a letter to the trust acknowledging uh, that we. Uh, we are deeply grateful for the, okay. for the gift. Excellent. Thank you. you well. um, okay, discussion item um, update on summer projects. $700, almost $4,800 expense for DM monitoring. Uh, we're just oh, getting an update I'm on the sorry. summer program. I thought we were still on the other thing. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, a member asked for us to, to review this again. Okay. Good evening, committee members. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. So we are back to provide another update on the health and safety projects that we did this summer. So just to recap, we were at Agnes Little, Flores Curtis, as well as Kerbin McCabe. Again, what we did here at, uh, excuse me, this is at Little. This is where we did the boiler replacement. We also did the preventative maintenance to the unit ventilators, as well as the installation of ceiling fans within the classrooms. We are complete with all construction right now. And at this stage, we are in the process of just training on the new equipment and making sure that everything's set and ready to go for the heating system, um, the heating season, excuse me. So you can see here's some additional photos of what the classrooms look like with the new ceiling fans. To the left, you can see one of the new controllers that are in at all of the classrooms for the teachers to use. This is some additional photos of the two new boilers that were put in. A lot of work went into this particular area. This was just a completion photo. Last time we had show that this had just been poured back. So you can see that now it is complete and the area is cleared out. And then transitioning over to Curtis. This is where we also had the prevent So, um, so little is is up and running. The fans work. The electricity is all plumbed yeah. back in. And the last photo, um, the the yellow. Uh, I'm assuming that's pieces of steel or kind of make that little gate around or, or a little mask around the, yep. the piping. But we didn't do it off to the left, which looks like new piping as well. 
Yes. And I'm just curious why we chose one versus the other. Sure. So where you have the metal structure, that's to protect the gas manifold. So as part of utility requirements and code, we have to protect that area in case there were some sort of object to, you know, run into it. So that is the barrier. Got it. And we didn't do the other, the, what are those, exhausts or? Yep. Those are just vent stacks that are coming out that's going to um, expel the air. I'm good. Thank you. Also, um, I know it looks like, you know, we got a new boiler system. Um, but I noticed in one of the pictures, um, we didn't update the or the company didn't update the um, temperature controls in the room. So that was not part of this uh, scope of work for this project. So we only addressed the controls within the Univent in terms of the other building management system that was not touched at this point. And it's not something that would have been included. So we are in the. Okay, so we are in the process of, let me stand corrected, we are in the process of updating the building management system, so that will be tied into the new boiler system. But as far as tying in all of the utilities within the building, not everything will be. Okay. So some of those thermostats may not be working. Um, I can't speak to if they're working or not. We did not touch the thermostats. We only worked on the control wiring of the univent in terms of controlling the thermostats to the boilers. That control system is what has been addressed. Tying in the rest of the utility system was not part of the scope of work. So we're going to have to replace all those thermostats at some point in time. So those thermostats are also tied to your cooling. Say again. So the thermostats that are in your building are also tied to cooling, I believe, within the system, within the building. So the controls that were just put in are isolated to your boiler system. Mm -hmm. so can you can you go back and show the picture? I think that that might. So so keep in mind this control switch. I apologize for not being more clear. This is tied to the operations of your fans only. So that's just a control switch for the air circulation, as as Wait. you can see. I was talking about. The oh, down below? Bit. So we just got a new boiler system. So for example, I'll just use an example. If I, if I get a new boiler system at home, most likely I'm going to update my thermostat. So yes. my question was, did the thermostats get updated also? And if not, why? It, wasn't it like a package deal? No, because we're touching two separate systems. I mean, certainly. Yeah, I can jump in a little bit. So, Ms. Grant, it's an, it's an excellent question, but in this case, the, the boiler replacement was really about going to a boiler that we knew would work. In many of these schools, some of the boilers were well beyond their useful life. And the controls for all of the spaces are through an online building management system that the facilities team can control. There is some temperature adjustments in some of the rooms that are quite old, but we wouldn't necessarily go back and change all of those individual devices and, and what Megan is saying we didn't as part of this project. The overall, the, the facilities team will be responsible for set points and temperatures to make sure that the rooms are operating within temperature tolerances that they should be. In some cases, those historical controls will allow the users to make slight modification. But overall, with all of these buildings for energy conservation purposes, mostly things have been automated at this point. And so as we get you know, further and further into bringing everything into automation and getting you into a, a bigger building management system, and that way it's very different from what you'd see at your house, if that, if that makes sense. Bye. I'm just thinking about my own system that I have at Johnson Wales. Now we have thermostats in all of our rooms, but none of them work anymore because they probably are using a similar system where they're just setting it all, they're automating it everywhere, but they just haven't removed the thermostats from our rooms. Am correct. I correct? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, but we, yes, we, we don't just have one person controlling it, correct? So They're, we're using the ones that are in each room. So generally speaking, there's a master setting in the software that's okay. controlling it. All right, there, there is one. Okay. Yeah, there's some overrides occasionally in classrooms, but we try and minimize that ju just because if someone accidentally hits it or adjusts it inappropriately, it could create a, a pretty big problem. Where currently in a building this big, the automated system allows you to kind of prevent problems like that. It's much easier to have a computer helping you manage this than individual users in every room and every space. We did leave those thermostats operational. Yes, we did. Okay. And we didn't enclose them or anything? We just left them like that? That is correct, yes. It was not in the part of scope to touch any of the thermostats. I got a question. Why wasn't it put in the scope? So I, I guess the, the point here being that it's not necessary. By and large, controls are essentially happening through an automated computer system that will not allow you to make adjustments that are inappropriate. But that's not what you just said. You said they could be adjusted individually. They can be adjusted individually, but generally speaking, the computer system has set points in it where it won't let you do certain things. So if you turn it up to 120, the computer is not going to let you do it. It'll override if you turn Clearly it down. Clearly, I understand that. Right. But you, you're going to have access to changing those things by everybody. And right. Then the computer will go back to the set whatever the parameters it's set at, at a later time. The, sort of. So basically the computer is gonna limit how much you can actually do. It, it, the, the threshold of what you can do from a local control is gonna be fairly limited. Ms. Manolo. So I understand that the computer system is the governor. So say the governor is set at 72, and someone feels they need to turn their heat up to 74, the computer system may allow that or will not allow that. Because if it doesn't allow that, then the governor is the computer system, the software, and that's the governor on all of it. So they're basically in effect book. Right. So there's the set points that we've mentioned before. That's going to be your benchmark of your minimum and your maximum temperatures. If they try to go above or below, the system's going to override it. I think, you know, these are old controls, the ones that you see on the bottom, and we can't do much more with that. You'll see at Curb and McCabe where they have all new mechanical systems, they have new lighting, new electrical, they have more of a true building management system that is operating as effectively as it should. We just tried to maximize based on the new boiler system that was installed. That was the priority for this project and that's you know what we have addressed. Right, and, and, and Ms. Spinolo, as, as a general rule to kind of get to the bigger picture, because really I think we're talking about just in general what the policy is. So in any organization with buildings of this size, typically the first thing you want to do within a reasonable time frame is get everything on an automated system. Then if there are local controls, they typically, even in big office buildings, will let a local, local user move things by a few degrees usually three or four at the most, um, but they're not going to allow for wild swings in temperature. It's like a tiny comfort setting and and two to three degrees probably you can notice you can notice in your own home actually makes a fairly big difference. But as as a general principle, that's typically how we're ma ma managing temperature within buildings. Okay. Move on to school number two. Oh, no questions? Okay. School number two. <laughs> so this is Curtis Elementary School, and this is where we did the preventative maintenance to the existing unit ventilators. And as mentioned in the last meeting, 
where we added the installation of ceiling fans to the classrooms. We are all complete with the preventative maintenance work. We are almost complete with the new ceiling fan work. We did hit in um, about a little bit of a back order with the new ceiling fans. So we do have about a third of the ceiling fans installed with the balance of them due in any day. We have already pre-wired for these fans and we will have them installed as soon as they get in. And that's been uh, ongoing work during second shift. So you can see these are the same fans that were installed at Little. Any questions on Little? <laughs> or excuse me, Curtis? Ms. Manella. Yes. I have a question for the superintendent. Wouldn't the lighting be more effectual if we had clean ceiling tiles? Can we look into what the cost would be to replace those? Start at one school and, and start working through because it's absorbing the light and they're, they're dark. Probably very old too. Thank you. That was my question. Sure. Thank you for those uh, two schools, and it really is great to see those fans in there. I'm sure that um, for the teachers who have those in, that's nice on these on warmer days. Certainly. So the next one that we have, which was the the major project for the summer, was Kirby McCabe. This was the full replacement of the HVAC system, the new roof, fire suppression. This is where we did all new lighting. We did replace the ceiling grid and ceiling tiles here. We do have the additions of new skylights, which just delivered within the past few days. Um, so a lot, a lot done at this project. Um, and we still, we are substantially completed. We are um, still doing some work second shift. Um, and we do have some ongoing roof work going on during the day. Um, and we'll take you through some of the, the pictures of this so you can see where we've progressed since last month. And you can see all new ceiling grid, ceiling tiles, and new LED lighting, uh, which has really kind of changed the feeling of many of the hallways and corridors. This is outside of the administration office. Because I remember what you said this on the tour, and I kept on saying, like, is that new? And you said, if you look up, everything's new. Everything is new. Yeah, so everything, like the fire things and all that. Yes, all of yeah. those devices are new. Exit signs. Were, some of the existing um, exit signs did remain. We all made sure that they were fully operational, tested. That was all part of uh, occupancy requirements. But you can see... Going back through, this is a continuation of the administration office as well as the nurse's office. These are just some more shots of the hallway so you can get an idea for this new lighting. And then taking you inside some of the classrooms, we have all new two by four lighting. We also, um, it's hard to tell in some of these pictures, but they come with a daylight harvesting feature to it. So where you have windows close to exterior or perimeter windows, it will lighten them just to help conserve energy. Some additional classrooms here showing the new ceiling, new lighting, new paint. <coughs> You can see here on the left. Now, these are some of the new controls that you'll see throughout the rooms. So these have been installed. They're still in the process of being programmed because we don't have all of the equipment that's tied to these controls. So that's still in process. You can see in the right photo, there's some of the skylights. As I mentioned, the skylights were delivered uh, just on Friday. They've started to assemble them on the roof, and we're looking to place our first one tomorrow morning. Yes. Does the teacher have access to open them? Or? So that's a great question, um, because that was a, a question that we all had, too. 
Um, it's going to be, again, with the set points that will lock you out, but there has been some conversations in terms of do we put a plastic cover on it that it's locked to avoid that. Uh, so that still is a continuing. I think we're cross question again. Were you asking about the skylights? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said the lights. I apologize. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. Ms. Grant was asking, can, you, can they open the sky? I like. Oh, no, no, no. Um, they can't just because they are so high up and they're a permanent fixture. So they are, once they get installed, they are sealed tight so that there's no way to move them um, to keep water from penetrating through. Thank you. Sorry. I just, I apologize. Absolutely. This was to try and um, bring in more daylighting to interior classrooms that do not have any sort of perimeter uh, daylight. So this was a, a ride suggestion. Yes. It's been all so I would presume that we have the same automated system taking care of the heat and um, the cooling. So why are there um, boxes in the classroom if they're not necessary? So let me see. Okay. If you can see right here, this is your VRF. It's a cassette there. That's going to help circulate your air throughout the room. So where you see, I believe it's this guy, oh no, I'm sorry, this guy, the Mitsubishi one, that's the control that regulates the flow from this register. You also have the BMS, the building management system control, and that's this guy right here. So you have two controls that you can basically control each of the rooms. These are all tied into this device right here. That's your building management system controller. So is there a minimum circulation tied in with that? Or they they can't adjust it, just building management can adjust it? So it goes back to they have a slight degree of control, but it can't be excessive. That's the set points. So that's what we establish for them. Okay. Did you say we are substantially complete? I uh, yes, we are. What other than the skylights? What remains? So what remains is the balance of the rooftop equipment. Which that, is I'm so, I'm sorry. Uh, how many? The balance of the rooftop equipment. So how many units? Sure. So it's a it's a split system. So there's two rooftop units that are scheduled to come in the beginning of October. We also have the additional ERV units, which help with the heating. There's about eight other pieces of equipment that need to go on the roof. We also have VIV boxes that have been on back order and due to ship next week. That's 45 of them. So you have that component to complete, which will be done during the second shift. You'll see in subsequent slides, we are getting very close to completing the roof work. And in conjunction with that, we have the skylight work. And this coming weekend, we have the electrical service switch over. So in order to accommodate all of this new mechanical system, we needed to bring in additional power. So we have that changeover scheduled for this Friday shutdown and coming back online Sunday evening. So this has been coordinated with National Grid, the electrical inspector, and also with the school themselves. Mr. Charbonneau, the one thing I would want to jump in and say too is that our definition of substantial completion essentially is that you're able to safely occupy the building. So that's a, a fairly uh, common standard and then you typically go into punch list. Admittedly, this punch list is longer than what you typically expect, but it's not for lack of work by the labor or the contractor. It is simply supply chain um, made it impossible to receive some of this equipment in time for install before school resumed. So basically we've rolled it over to a punch list. But again, that substantial completion definition and what we were really focused on at the end of the summer was life safety equipment that would allow us to open on time and turn the school over. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned because at the, at the prior meeting, I made an issue of where we were with liquidated damages and I felt that the project was, was behind schedule. I don't see that we're a lot further along than we were 
In other words, we still, the skylights aren't even in yet. The first one's gonna get dropped tomorrow. The roof units aren't even up in here. We have 45 other boxes to put. So initially I was gonna say, you know, listen, maybe because of the supply glut in the, in the that we relax some liquidated damages. But when I'm hearing the term substantially complete brought up tonight, I'm saying it doesn't look that way to me. And I guess, Derek, what your point is, it, the, the different definitions, I get it. I just, I wanted to make a point about talking about the liquidated damages because I, I kind of went off on that last meeting. And I have since driven by the site several times at varying portions of the day, parts of the day. Um, and there is, you know, there, there was people on the roof, uh, you know, probably 10, 12, I was trying to count as I was driving by. But um, so I want to be mindful and fair that as we progress with these projects, if there is a supply issue that affects the vendor's ability to complete the, I guess, long story short, but I'm not looking to hold anybody accountable to liquidated damages but we got to get this we got to get it done and we you know to say we're substantially complete with what appears to me to be a lot more work left to do i want to be fair but i want to make sure that our vendors are being fair in return that's all sure so i i appreciate the update mr knight so substantial completion that we're reporting here meet rides version of substantial completion? It does. So typically, especially like on a larger projects, which, which is where we, we run into this more so with ride, ride typically wouldn't be involved to this detail on a project of this size. But generally speaking, we're up against a, a financial year end and substantial completion essentially means that the architectural team has signed off on and given us a punch list. It is safe to occupy the building so we can begin moving. And, and I think all of these comments have been really great and informative. And I, and I think from our perspective, at the last meeting when we went through this initially with everyone, um, one of the reasons perhaps that there was so much focus on the substantial completion dates and how the project was doing was there was significant work that happened at the very end of the summer again based on supply chain but we were able to pull it off through careful coordination with the contractor to get all of the life safety done and there were a few moments there where we like to say that we managed things perfectly that it was a little touch and go and so i think the focus on the dates and getting done is appropriate um, but I want to also say that the contractor lived up to what they needed to do um, to serve the citizens of Pawtucket to make sure that you would open on time in a safe way and they would handle the punch list professionally and appropriately. And we got there. So I think it is and was a really important topic. It will continue to be, uh, but it, you know, it, it was a journey we needed to take. In terms of final completion, it's really based on delivery times at this point. So we believe that the remaining roof and HVAC will be done at the end of October and will be able to completely close out by the end of November. So it is gonna take a little bit longer, but much of the work is, is going to happen in the fairly near term in terms of the things that are outstanding. Ms. Manala. So once upon a time, when they first started over to change the systems into automated systems for get, um, heat and electric, gas and electric. Um, we, we were informed of the amount of savings that we would obtain by doing this. So it's pretty standard that we're putting these systems in now and that they have a main control system, which is great. But at some point in time, it would be nice to know or to be informed that having done this, the district would be saving X amount of dollars in electric and gas. Now, I don't know if you can do that or if John Cody can do that or 
someone can do that, but it would be nice because we have put these systems in. So I think we need to appreciate the savings that are coming along with the expense. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and really those will, and I believe have been showing up on your utility bills. So we can work with the, the facilities team or the people who would know because they have them, but we can absolutely work with them and, and come up with a strategy to talk about that data. Mr. Shabinow. I just one follow up, Derek, because you kind of uh, threw me there for a second. I, I thought the packet said, can we go back a couple of slides? I thought we, we indicated in the packet that we were going to be done by the 1029. And I think I just heard you say that now it's going to be 11. So that additional time in November is just to go through the startup and the commissioning of all of the new equipment. So that's just a rough time frame. So once we get everything online, there's a separate training commissioning and just remaining punches, but that's that only time period. So any time in November is going to be used for training. We're not still going to be, I, I now I have a concern about are we going to have heat in this building? when it's needed for, and if we're waiting on pots, I thought we were done the end of October, now I'm hearing November, what, when is the system gonna be able to be turned on? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the heating component, based on the delivery times of that equipment, we are being told that that's gonna be operational by October 8th. So you will have heat to the building by October 8th, I know we like to target for October 15th as the deadline. So we have emphasized that greatly that we need to make sure that we have heating to this building. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that last month, not much is happening other than us performing tests to make sure that over the many years that you're operating it, the system will perform for you. <laughs> All right. um, I want to thank colleagues for giving us this presentation um, and, and adding up the, I know that since we, last spoke we have seen schools open um, and I know across the country we've heard reports about multiple schools some right in Rhode Island that were unable to open for the school year because of construction projects that because of lag times were not able to open so I really appreciate that we were able to get all of our schools open and that summer after summer after doing ambitious projects we are able to get our buildings opened back up um, on those tight time frames so thank you yep. And then just really quickly to close out the presentation, we do have a few photos to show you the new roof that has been installed. So you can see right there that's your base layer of insulation. The black sheathing on top is your base layer. Um, and then on top you have your final mineral cap, which is the white. And then this is what you're seeing going on right now. So Mr. Charbonneau, if you drove by, you see them up there doing this at this point. And then over the next few days, they're gonna start doing a skylight insulation. And then in terms of the roof, they do just have um, the capping to go on around the perimeter of the building. So they're getting very close um, and working hard on the roof, especially. The school's been great to work with. Great. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we have, um, I, I know um, Ms. Devine is not, unable yes. to be here. She said if you have any questions, I will take them and she okay. will follow up in an email. Okay, so we have the monthly vendor report, um, and so if there's any questions, um, we will take those and um, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Glenn can speak to them if she knows what they are, and otherwise we'll follow up with Ms. Devine. We also have our overtime report, and I think let's just do questions on those two as we usually do, and then we can go over that enrollment, um, suspension, and expulsion report separately for questions. Mr. Murray. Um, th this is actually a Hirsch question, I think. Um, the hots, hots, the, 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 um, um, from T, Mama, 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 Oval, we ate, um, we, we paid um twenty um thousand. We only use those if we did on our internet or Wi-Fi. 
we actually uh, obtained those during the distance learning time oh. um, for students that needed internet access at home. And uh, we've actually also applied for uh, part of the FCC emergency connectivity fund. So we're hoping that uh, we also have to get reimbursed for those once that comes in. So your anticipation is that would be offset by um, those FCC funds? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, why do we have uh, a charge on here for $2,200 for fish, frisky fries? <laughs> I, I can hear you, but could what you have to say? Twenty-two hundred dollar charge for frisky fries. LLC. Okay, let me shift to that. I don't know who that is. They have a food truck. I don't know if that was used for the food truck from Tony. It may have. I can. I can definitely get that answer okay. for you. Okay. Wasn't that wasn't paid for by the city? That was paid for by the district. Those food trucks for the. the I, I will have to follow up on that. I, I oh no, for the for the sauce that was by the city. There was a frisky fries for that one. Okay. We'll, we'll yeah, get, if someone could get that. I will get. I'll, we'll get that answer to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Knight. We got a uh, forty-seven eighty-seven DM water Lonigan paint. It's D, you said. Yeah, it's. Uh, Almost five thousand dollars. Doesn't say what it's for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? And Dr. McWilliams has said that Ms. Devine will mm -hmm. when she's back. She'll be on vacation. Yeah. When she's back on vacation, she'll get the responses to us. Okay. Anything for the overtime report? Like okay. Okay, and then we also have any questions on the enrollment, suspension, or expulsion reports. Ms. Vanilla? Okay, so the enrollment report, I, I did um, an analysis at home mm -hmm. and our enrollment is down by about 500 um, with the only schools increasing are the high schools. Correct. Um, Tolman and Shea. So is it possible to get a five-year spread on enrollment stats so we can see the pattern of decrease i know when i was talking to you you said people are moving south um it's obvious that people are um doing homeschooling but we need to see where this trend is taking us because all of our elementaries and middle schools have decreased which means the enrollment in our high schools are going to decrease as well so so it's good to, yeah, you're correct. It's good to have that trend analysis as we go forward, especially where we're going with, you know, projects and schools. So um, I'll be speaking to Mr. Cristino about can that. Can we get it in the spreadsheet so we can actually on our own manipulate it instead of making our own? And Ms. Vanilla, I also did look at, um, and just, uh, so I looked at Warwick because Warwick is a comparable size district. Their enrollment from, the last year to this year went from 8,500 to 8,000. So they saw a 500 student. So like I said, a comparable district still almost the exact same. The national trend is every, in nationally, we are down 3% in public schools. Our state trend is actually a little bit better, down 2.6%. And like I said, Warwick, a comparable district. This is year, this is year after year. So literally last year to this year, this is the um, trend. But um, I do know that in general, actually the biggest decreases have been in um, the rural communities of Rhode Island where smaller family sizes have dropped enrollment much more than the cities. So that number, that 3% is much more highly represented in rural settings than cities. So we can get a trend mm -hmm. because I mean, that's looking at staffing, that's looking at um, income into the district. It's encompassing a lot. Mr. Knight. 
Um, how many students did we have total last year? I believe it was 8,670. 8, 8, so year. we're down about 38 total. 38 students? Yeah, it says our total number of students is 8,632. The total numbers are on the bottom of both pages, so it's 8632. I'm talking about the total number of students is 8632, and last year it was 8670. So we're well within not being able to be cut by the city council, because that's what they did to us. Chris, you want to speak to the enrollment numbers? Thank you. 8125 is the number. 8125. Yes. Um, we are, we're down, as uh, Ms. Benoel said, I think it was about three and change. We come. Uh, three to four. Uh, in that point. Our numbers are lower and the one thing that um, what well, we looked at is um, actual enrollment which is a little different from what RIDE will use for calculation of funds because what they use is actually your average daily membership which because as we know kids coming in, come in and come and come out of the district. Uh, one of the things I will point out and um, it'll be a little bit more evident when you see the, that analysis of the numbers one of the things that has led a, a bit to our decline uh, over the years is also, you see the map, you'll see that kindergarten bubble because we used to, Pawtucket used to offer the, the only uh, district around that had the full day kindergarten. So when you, we saw our numbers there and that's presently, I believe it's the last of it is kind of in the seventh grade area where those students have come up from the kindergarten and then as other communities started offering full day kindergarten, they, the students, you know, were, may have gone to the community where they were in <laughs> somewhere along the way. But so you'll see that bubble uh, through the years as it goes up, goes up. And then when we go from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, that's where we'll lose uh, students also to the vocational programs and, and, and things like that, such as uh, Davies. So every year we drop about 200 students there and that's where our numbers have been consistent. There is that little bit of a bubble in the high schools and I believe that's also part of that kindergarten group as they went up, stayed within the high schools and we started uh, attracting students into our district so we didn't get as much of a loss. Uh, but unfortunately that's where our kindergarten numbers have been low um, in the last two or three years and once they're low at that point, like you said, that, that number stays staggered. So if you lose um, 100 kids every year, that's 100, 100, 100, there's three to 400 students that you'll lose over the course of time. But I would more than have, oh, I can get more detailed numbers for you. Mr. Knight. How many students do we have enrolled in this school system right now? That's the question. 125. Where is that? On the bottom of the first page, so if you flip the tab, Mr. Knight, like literally take the tab that the, that the tab is on. If you have tab, the first page, oh, you don't have tab, sorry. <laughs> the very first page that has information on it. Yeah, at so the bottom of the page. And then on page five, it says 80. They're two different years. They're two different years. That was June. That was June. That's how we closed it. The 81 is in September. So we've lost about 500 pieces. Yeah, that's why I gave the comparison of Warwick, because that was the same drop. Warwick went. It doesn't yeah. matter about Warwick. Well, I'm, I'm about just, Pawtucket. I, I was just saying that that was why I gave that as a statistic. Pawtucket lost 500 students this year. Mm -hmm. And when does um, our reimbursement number kick in from the state? January 1st, 2020? So uh, first, October 1st is what they use for the preliminary for title. Um, and then we again in March, the March 15th date comes out again with those numbers are reevaluated um, as well. And I, I want to be um, totally candid and, and let everybody know one of the things that ha happens right now in the schools is what we call the cleanup from the beginning of the year, where we clean up what we call uh, <coughs> duplicate students with other districts. Uh, we get notified that, you know, Johnny's over in Warwick and he's also in Pawtucket and all that clearing up. So I want to make sure that when you look at that, uh, 
8125 number, I want to make sure that you know that there's going to be further cleaning up that will bring that to the true number as kids come and go. Uh, and I hate to say it, but one of the things that happens every year is uh, that that Labor Day um, is sometimes students don't start until after Labor Day um, for whatever reason. So that number I want to I just want to make totally clear that we're, we're in that cleaning up and I, I believe also the PK they're still registering. I, I think as Dr. Gifford was saying this thing so those those numbers go up in the PK as well. Yes as both my daughters have reported they have three new students in each of their classes within the past like two days or so. <laughs> I have a question, Mr. Knight. What did we base our budget on? How many students? <laughs> that that I, that I might be a question yeah, for I, Melissa. I, uh, yeah, a question for Melissa. I don't want to do a guess. Was oh, sorry, I can't March, In March, it, we would have grabbed those the enrollment numbers from March and based the numbers on that. And that is what uh, Ride pulled and gave us the funding for. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can certainly have Melissa. Go to the next meeting. Sure. I think it was 88. Okay. Any other questions on this? No? Um, thank you, Ms. Christina. Um, we will now move on to Superintendent's report. Dr. McWilliams. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. I want to say congratulations to our all of our educators, principals, teachers. It's great to be back in school, and I've been visiting the schools, and it's nice to see the students engaged and happy and I think one of the students in their presentation from one of the high schools tonight did mention that even though we, we you know we're struggling a little bit sometimes with masks I'm always getting my glasses fogged up the kids are just the students are just going right along and they're adjusting and it's just good to see the students back in school I also had the opportunity to go to some of the back to school events and those were wonderful and I think it was also mentioned um, by one of our students from high schools that one of the key things that I noticed was a lot more parent interaction, parent engagement, parents coming to events. So that is really, really good to see. So I just want to say thank you to all those who um, serve our students and our families. We appreciate you. Um, school committee member updates. Um, we'll start with Ms. Bonolo. Um, I don't have a lot to say. I'm back on the wellness committee and we are always looking for willing participants amongst our teachers. Um, so if you know anybody, send them my way. Um, I hope you had, as far as our staff, I hope you had a wonderful summer. I'm glad you have stayed with us and nobody has retired over there. <laughs> and. Um, it's just nice to be back in school. My granddaughter's back in school. She loves it. Um, we'll see how long that lasts, but it's nice to see the kids. It, it really is. It's, uh, I do pick up every day and, and it's just so nice. We didn't do the incident report. Oh yeah, we kind of skip right over it. Enrollment suspension. Can we back up? We can return to the discussion item. Yeah. Do you have a question on that? Well, it's disappointing. I know that um, we were on distance learning, but as an example, Pullman had five incidents. Twenty. Uh, in 2021, the whole year, they had 13. We're already at five. Um, and I know some of it's going back to school um, and having been on distance learning, but are we putting more support out there for our students um, to deal with these issues? Because we knew distance learning was going to be a factor. In, in their emotional status. Um, uh, do we have enough support staff to handle these things? And are our teachers reaching out 
So I feel confident that the guidance counselors, the teachers, and the principals are reaching out. But with that being said, as you know, as you get my updates, um, we are seeing some of that increase, particularly at the high schools. You'll see both Tom and Shay. So that is something that I am discussing, you know, with them what additional supports that we need to put in in way of those mental health professionals such as social workers and things like that. Okay, thank you. And that's it for me. Thank you. Mr. Charbonneau? Uh, yeah, no, uh, welcome back uh, to our teachers, our staff, our faculty. Uh, we, we have the second meeting of our ad hoc committee on the unified high school. Um, I think it was a productive meeting. Uh, we set kind of next steps as a group. Um, the mayor's administration had provided the documents we requested prior. Uh, I, I think the meeting, like I said, was productive. I think there's, there's a long way to go on a unified high school um, conversation and, and where it goes from there, if anywhere. But I, I think the spirit in the room at the meeting, it, it was, was positive and um, I think a lot of good feedback came out. So I, I appreciate the, those folks, those members of our school family and the city family that serve on that committee and offered some thoughtful feedback and, uh, and, and clearly laid out where our next steps go. So like I said, long way to go in this conversation. I will bring updates and, and certainly there will be topics that the, this committee will have to decide. Um, I, I anticipate the first one being um, there is going to be some uh, communication out to the, to the city. Um, I think everybody recognized that the survey, um, while positive in favor of a unified high school, only grabbed a small sample size. So we're talking about doing something on a bigger scale to kind of gauge community interest. Is the city behind this idea as well? Um, and there's gonna be some expenditure of money that comes to get us to a point where we're able to uh, adequately present to the city. So we're talking about some renderings and uh, so there'll be other things coming to this committee, but I, I wanted to update you that the, the second meeting was, was productive and uh, our next meeting is scheduled for a week from this coming Thursday, so the 23rd of September. Thank you, good night. Ms. Grant. Um, first, I wanna welcome everyone back also. Um, unfortunately, um, due to vacations and things like that, this is actually my first experience being involved with a with a school um, item. Um, and you know, we usually share things that strike us as positive um, during our um, school committee updates. But as I sat here tonight during the meeting, I couldn't stop thinking about a comment that was made. And I just wanted to say our teachers work very hard and so do our administration. But to actually hear someone say, I have a lot to do already is very difficult to hear, um, especially if it could have a negative effect on a certain population of schools. So I apologize if I seemed a little distracted tonight. Um, I um, just kept thinking about, you know, um, our district needs to be more of a team. Um, our departments need to work together um and it just you know it just really struck me that someone would actually <laughs> say that out loud um but on a brighter note i'd like to thank karen gerba and lisa ramsey um, of the busing department um so far i know busing has been just just a disaster just in life um, getting drivers, but today I needed to stop by um, the ad building to drop off um, a note. And I got to see them both in action. They both had a cell phone in their hand while picking up the desk phone. And But I saw nothing but two gracious people. Um, someone came into the office because someone was standing out in the waiting room, wanted to talk to them. And I thought this is a, is a great example of the type of employees we want and we want seen out there. 
Um, our students are the most important things to us and, and their families. Um, so, you know, anything we have to do to help them um, with a smile and um, a friendly hello and do what we need to do, I know I would appreciate that. Um, so, but I hope everyone has a good year and um, hopefully things turn around and um, people get help where they need, need it. Mr. Mike. I just have one thing to talk about. Uh, September 11th is a nasty memorial for everyone. We had a celebration of opening schools on September 11th. My point that I'd like to make is I just think that was not well thought out. I think our teachers and our staff do a great job, but I don't think having a celebration on September 11th, when we have a family in Pawtucket that is directly affected by the September 11th horror, was the best thing to do. That being said, uh, I wish we had rethought it. And the other thing that I wish we had uh, taken care of before today is having a political announcement at a school construction site where we have to make sure that they don't do it on the construction site itself. It has to be outside the fence. I think we need to send a letter to all of the candidates not to do that. Evidently, they don't think that's correct, but that's life. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to just welcome back both our students and our teachers. Um, I, I do have a nephew who uh, um, was having some development issues and was placed into the, one of the pre clay classrooms at three years old. And um, I just want to attest that that made a tremendous difference in his development. And um, now he's five, he loves school, and he's excited to be back inside the building. Um, so I just want to thank um, all our teachers for for building that excitement in our young people. And I look forward to seeing the amazing things that happen this year. Mr. Marino. Um, um, uh, thank you, everyone. I want to um, welcome back the um, school uh, community. And, and I want to um, um, uh, thank everyone um, uh, for con continuing to to um, prioritize the um, the um, the um, public health um, uh, um, situation that that is an, uh, that unfortunately is an ending, and I don't think that um, we, 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 we will um, see an end in um, sight. Um, all of you are um, making with uh, what we have, and it's a um, team effort. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, echoing out what Ms. Marino said, uh, we are now on day 550 since. Um, we first, I know most of us school committee members met to talk about the fact that we had had cases at St. Ray's. So um, the fact that our teachers have had to shift so much and now they're opening up yet again in a pandemic, um, it, it really, I know what that does to, um, to drain. And I really am, I'm like, when I see the teachers of my daughters, they're all smiles and I know that that takes a lot of effort. Um, and I also did want to um, speak to the preschool presentation we had um, because I think one thing that was left out that is really important is uh, the Bright Star rating, which um, really makes our preschool program the envy of uh, many other programs in the state that we, um, we have been able to maintain that Bright Star rating year after year after year. And um, I know that my own daughter really benefited from that program. So I thank everyone involved in the program. And that's what I have.
So I think that's it. Then a motion to adjourn by Mr. Charbonneau. It's been seconded by Ms. Marino and Ms. Grant. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Okay, we are adjourned at 8.43.